Icons 8 Music. Hello, hello. Welcome to another Simtastic episode of uh, Sim Important Conversations at SD State. I am your host, uh, Master of Cimarronis, Patrick Verley, here with another um, exciting installment of our podcast series. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about uh, certification and simulation, uh, what the benefits of that are, what the requirements of that are. And we are very privileged to have some certified simulationists right on our uh, panel today. And so I'm going to give them a moment to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about uh, their experience in being certified in simulation. I'll start us off, Patrick. Um, Alyssa Zweifel. I am the Healthcare Simulation Center Director and Assistant Professor here at um, SDSU College of Nursing. And I hold um, the CHSE certification, and I've been certified since 2019. This is Paula Carson. Um, retired. And I've been certified with CHSE since 2016. And I'm Diane. I am the simulation education technician for the College of Nursing in Sioux Falls. And I obtained my certified healthcare simulation operations specialist, otherwise known as CHSOS in 20 of 21. And I'm Takara Schomburg. I am um, the simulation site coordinator and instructor at our uh, SD State College of Nursing Sioux Falls site. Um, I've held the certified healthcare simulation educator, the CHSE, um, since 2021. That's great. Thank you all for um, introducing yourselves. And as I'm listening, Diane, I noticed that your certification um, actually has one additional letter. Um, which it's even, it's multiple more syllables, certified healthcare simulation operations specialist. You about need a bottle of water after introducing yourself, I would imagine. Yes. Very good. So um, one of the things that we want to talk about in today's episode is um, the College of Nursing's accrediting body, which is the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, or SSH. Uh, the SSH, incidentally, is also our certifying body, which brings us to an important question of what is the difference between accreditation and certification being is that, again, both of those um, processes are administered by the same organization. So, Alyssa, do you want to talk a little bit about the differences between accreditation and certification, please? Sure. Yep. And that's a really good point because here at um, SD State, um, our College of Nursing Healthcare Simulation Center is also accredited through SSH. Um, We actually provisionally accredited since 2018 um, and we hold um, provisional accreditation in the core standards and then the teaching and education standards. Um, And we are actually sitting for full accreditation, Um, but that's just really the system. Um, So our program, our Healthcare Simulation Center program is accredited, Um, just really shows that we're meeting the standards. Uh, You know, we're meeting all of the healthcare simulation standards of best practice. We're doing professional development. We're following... um, operations and having outcomes. And the reason we sat for provisional versus full accreditation in 2018 is just really that that data piece, having those program outcomes and all of our evaluation data. Um, You have to have five years of data. So we do have that now. um, And we're excited, you know, to really just showcase our program and the great things excuse me, the great things that we're doing in in healthcare simulation. And then, of course, the certification piece is more of that validating an individual's knowledge and skills related to healthcare simulation. Can I build off of that briefly, Patrick? Yes, please. Thank you. 
what I think I really love about those two processes is that they really um, augment one another. So, you know, us holding that provisional accreditation at SD State um, demonstrates our, our commitment to that, that high cal- caliber and high quality simulation. And I think that really produced a culture um, that that gave us a lot of simulationists that said, hey, I really want to, you know, step up my personal um, approach to simulation. I really want to be personally better to enhance this further, um, you know, and to, to support these high standards that we're holding. Um, and in that same way, I think the more simulationists we have that gain certification personally, um, the more, again, more driven we are to hold those high standards um, or for our accreditation in our program. So they, our accreditation drove our certification. And I think our certification is um, reinforcing our, our drive to be accredited. Good point, Takar. You know, when we sat and got provisional accreditation in 2018, you know, we only had two two instructors um, within our college of nursing that ha- that held a certification, and now we have four um, CHSEs and one CHSOS. So that even shows, you know, that dedication and how our accreditation process drove some individuals to to get certified just for their own own knowledge and professional development. Yeah. Well, so it sounds like the two, um, very, uh, reciprocal to one another. And, you know, when I think of accreditation, I think of a organization and a certification is for a, a person. Okay. So the next thing I think we want to talk about is the, uh, requirements, um, and what types of experience and, um, expertise and skill set someone needs in order to to acquire their certification. And I think it's important to talk about both the CHSC and the CHSOS, given that there, I understand, are different requirements for each. Isn't that right? Slightly different. They're, they're very similar, but just based on operations versus education components. Um, for the CHSOS, um, you need to actually be active in the operations role. Um, and then you need to have a bachelor's degree or equivalent combination of education and experience and two years um, experience in a healthcare simulation operations role. So um, you, if you do not have a bachelor's, but you have enough other experience, you can petition the board to be able to apply to become certified. Can anyone else speak to the differences or the similarities? Because I'm assuming they must be, there must be some key differences. Otherwise there wouldn't be two different ones, right? Yeah, Patrick, you know, the biggest difference is that role that the individual is playing. So in the CHSC, it's really that focus of healthcare simulation in the education role um, and This particular certification, you know, is really looking at healthcare simulation in general. So it's not specific to nursing, not specific to a provider role. You know, it can be various different disciplines within healthcare simulation, but it's really that the educator role um, versus, you know, Diane is that operations specialist role. I see. So in that regard, they are somewhat um, self-explanatory. Sounds like the CHSOS is a little bit more focused on that technical aspect. Um, and, and if I'm understanding you, Alyssa, then a CHSC, for instance, would, would that person be able to facilitate a simulation for um, any member of the healthcare team? So could they help run a simulation for respiratory therapy, for instance? Yeah, and definitely, you know, we do a fair amount of interprofessional simulation activities, you know, just within our program. And we include the, you know, faculty and the specialists from each discipline, but the person that's really focused on the simulation and meeting the standards and making sure all of the different disciplines are, you know, having a mutual outcome and goals. And, you know, there's a lot of planning prior to for interprofessional events. 
And that pre-briefing and debriefing, you know, that's really that simulation expertise. And it doesn't matter if, you know, they're a nurse or encompassing those best practices of simulation. Really glad you brought that up, Patrick, because that is also um, the area we continue to grow in. And, um, you know, we sometimes have encountered people who question uh, why, why we call ourselves an HCSC, a healthcare simulation center. Um, but it is because we are gearing, gearing ourselves to have that broader scope. We, we encompass grad and undergrad. We have IP partners, which um, I believe we'll be hosting some of our IP partners on a future podcast here. Um, but as we continue to grow as a simulation center, you know, we are really focused on who, who we can bring in and, and bring to that table and how we can continue to um, expand that scope of good, high quality simulation. You know, Patrick, I don't know if Dr. Carson or, or Dr. Zweifel would be willing to, to speak to this, but um, there is also the advanced certification for both our CHSC and CHSOS. None of us have attained it to this point, but um, they would be closer to qualifying than myself. Oh, you want to take that one? So the um, CH, CHSEA is one level up so far as um, going beyond what the role of the CHSE is. The qualifications, I believe, are a little bit longer, Dr. Zweifel? Yes. So, um, you know, the qualifications, they have to hold a current CHSE to be able to um, advance to that that A portion. Um, And then you have to have a master's degree and five years of healthcare simulation um, experience in education research or administration. There's also the advanced um, CHSOSA. Um, Diane, since you're the expert in that, is, is there any differences from the, the CHESI? Um, again, you need to have the five years experience. You have to be a certified healthcare simulation operations specialist. Um, and then there's just a lot more research and, and involvement on the national level than there would be for the regular. Another difference is that with the first two, um, the CHSE and the CHSOS, that is an exam, a national exam qualifying um, in order to achieve that certification versus with the additional A that is done by portfolio. So a couple of things I'm thinking about. The first thing is, is that one of our CHSEs could go get their CHSEA and now they'd have the same number of letters as Diane. So they'd be tied, but then Diane would go and get CHSOSA and then she'd be back on top because we all know the more letters is the winner, right? And and I recently saw that the CNE came out with a CNE. N. And so I'll be curious to see if our simulation certifiers um, follow suit with an, with a CN uh, a CHSEN or well, as the y- N stands for novice. I don't know that they'll be as inclined. Well, you know, I mean, there could be. You never know. Or 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 you know, do we get so high fidelity and advanced that we have to do a CHSEAA um, for accelerated advance? Patrick, I like how your mind works. You are always looking to go to the next level. Yeah. I think it, I I think it switches that. over to E at the end to be expert. C-H-S-E-A-E. So now we're at Chesia. Chazia. Okay, so then the next thing to talk about, I think, is, uh, you know, what was the reasoning that, that each of you chose to become certified? I mean, certainly there's lots of different certifications that um, people in our profession can hold. And, uh, of course, there's lots of literature to support the benefits and the importance of being certified in your specialty area or areas, uh, but generally people need to find something within themselves or, or some special reason that they have for, for continuing 
in their uh, professional development. So I'd be curious to hear from each of you, why did you choose to become certified? Um, and what, what are some of the benefits that you have found to having certification um, personally? So I, that's a great question, Patrick. And um, the reason that it was on my agenda or it was on my radar to even pursue um, was really, really kind of ties into uh, my uh, increasing involvement, I guess, in simulation education. But the more I've, I've worked in simulation, the more I've really um, loved it and the pedagogy behind it and the way it drives critical thinking and clinical reasoning in our students. Um, so with that, you know, I took over that simulation site coordinator role. Um, and I felt like, um, that certification would really support me doing well in, in that. And it, I think certainly it's helped me in my facilitation, um, of course, but, um, the CHSC, because it's a little bit broader and goes a little bit beyond, um, just good teaching. Um, it, it made me think about more of the systems and the design and the operations and um, managing our facilities and being fiscally responsible and, and all these programmatic pieces that are um, at least a part of my role. Um, and the other huge benefit is Diane and I actually um, got our certifications pretty close to one another. You know, we work closely together here in Sioux Falls. And I think that has been a, a huge boost to our effectiveness um, as a site that, you know, it just gives us a lot more of a common understanding and common language. Like we were a great team before, but now I really feel like we have a much stronger partnership and we um, can can do some higher level planning for our site and, and bring some really good high quality um, simulation to our students. Being is that 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 certification, again, as Takara mentioned, it really transcends um, interprofessional roles and it helps to create, as you mentioned, kind of a um, consistent way of looking at things. And so now someone, even though their clinical background might be in nursing, um, can now support the learning of respiratory therapists, um, medical students, um, and really anyone. And likewise, a, a CHSC that's, that's a, that has background in respiratory therapy, for instance, um, can can support the learning of people that aren't specifically within their own discipline, if you would. Which, of course, creates um, for a much more holistic experience. I would imagine that it's difficult to facilitate an interprofessional education experience, for instance, if you're so hyper-focused on your one um, profession, right? Now you're better able to appreciate um, the priorities of those other disciplines and domains as well. Right. But well, it elevates your teaching past just your, your immediate students and, mm -hmm. and makes you think about good SIM, you know, good SIM education um, and really focus you back on those larger objectives um, and the larger um, outcomes that we're seeking to, to accomplish. Paula, what, why did you get certified? Um, I was a late comer to simulation. And um, the more I got into it, the more I saw the value of it. To echo what you said, Takara, it, it allows you to um, provide a learning opportunity for students where they can learn and um, not have fear of danger to their patients. And what I found out was uh, it just... it reinforced my reason for continuing into simulation. I, I found that I didn't have the language for simulation. I didn't have um, some of the abilities to use some of the modalities with that. And yes, you can get that with repeated exposure to that, but by going and becoming certified, I was in now a community of other learners outside of nursing with um, different organizations that are out there. And um, it helped me, I think, achieve at least a beginning competency in simulation. It let me become more comfortable in my practice as an educator, which then I could translate into having uh, better uh, outcomes for my students. Paula, you said something that made me think of something I actually heard another faculty mention, and, and they're not on the episode with us today. 
but she had talked about how her experience in facilitating simulations and and debrief and pre-brief sessions has um, not only obviously helped her become more proficient with regard to simulation, but actually has increased her um, competency and confidence within different teaching modalities, including uh, theory classroom, including clinical. And I'd be curious to know as, as you know, people that have worked in different types of nursing educational capacities that you have an, have a, any experience with that type of phenomenon as well. I like that thought, Patrick, in that um, I know uh, we had another faculty here who asked us to think, where does simulation start and stop between the classroom, in the scenario, and in the clinical room? And I think that it, it blurs the lines, if you will, because... Um, as Takara said, good teaching is good teaching. I just, I just feel so passionate about simulation. And I think to go back to the question of why I pursued certification is that I felt I was not being able to practice to the highest extent as an educator within the simulation opportunities that I had for my students without pursuing the certification. I think one of the things that you said uh, Paula, that I thought was really neat was that you said that the reason that you got CHSE certified was for the students, um, which I think is, an, I mean, it's, it sounds kind of cliche on one hand, but then on the other hand, it's really an important thing to think about. Um, you know, I would imagine that you got your CCRN certification for the patients as well. And, you know, I think a lot of times we talk about getting certified to demonstrate our commitment to our specialty area. Um, and so I think that there's a certain amount of prestige and such that goes along with that, but being mindful of really the priority and, and of course in education, our, our priority is the student. Um, but I think that's a good reminder for all of us too. I can go next, next Patrick, this is Alyssa. Um, so when I got certified, I was actually working on my PhD. So, you know, I was at SD State while we went through provisional accreditation in 2018 and just learned a lot about um, accreditation versus certification. Prior to that, I did my master's thesis in simulation, but it was focused on uh, nurses in a practice setting doing simulation. So I kind of, you know, went to the academic side, um, but my drive was just seeing that accreditation process, seeing how important the standards are and how it brings you to that next level as I started working on my PhD dissertation, which was in simulation related to participant roles. Um, that was kind of my drive to, to individually get, get certified and in 2019, knowing that I wanted to get to that next level, I was going to do research in simulation, and I just wanted to be able to show and validate that I they had the knowledge and skills. So that was my drive. Um, I actually just got recertified, um, and that was a whole you know different experience in itself. But it really just keeps me individually at at the top of my game to do the best I can in simulation. And again, it's, it's for the students, right? We're here to help the students learn. Um, there's a lot of, you know, on-campus, off-campus clinical that we're starting to talk about in, in our structure. And a lot of that on-campus clinical really correlates to off-campus cl clinical. And when we're following the best practices, it really just gives our students an amazing learning experience. Okay, well, Patrick, this is Diane, and I, um, it was a personal goal for me to become certified. When I first started working in simulation in 2014, I had no idea what I was doing. I landed this job, and I'm like, what the heck am I supposed to be doing? So I started, you know, researching, um, nursing simulation and discovered these Anaxal um, standards that were out there. I was like, well, wow, how about this? 
And at that point in time, it was just the re- first revision that had been done in 2013. And I was like, man, this is kind of groundbreaking stuff. I think I want to get in on this. So I started looking and reading about those and, and kind of went from there. And at that point in time, I made that a personal goal for myself to do that at some point in time. So I was very happy when I came to SDSU um, and realized that you guys had received your provisional accreditation. And it's like, wow, okay, so now it's really time for me to get that done. So, Yeah, and Diane, so I heard you say that when you had first started working in nursing education, you felt like you, I think you said you felt like you had no idea what you were doing. Oh, I had no clue what I was doing. (laughs) Yeah, and you know, I have to be honest, I totally um, don't know what that feels like at all. (laughs) Right? Um, Yeah, feeling like you're just completely drowning and having no idea where to even begin and And I think that that's something that certification does afford you with, you know, we've, I've heard the word on, on this episode, I've heard the term standardization a couple of times. And I think that that really helps in providing, again, that consistency and that structure. Um, It makes sure everyone's kind of on the same page because now you can go to any, any simulation site, work with any group of people. And if they're all certified, they all have the same objectives in mind. They all have the same priorities. They all have a universal understanding of what's the most important thing. Um, and I think it feels, it, it sounds like it really takes a lot of the guesswork out of, of some of that. It, it lays for a nice blueprint to follow, a great template to follow when you're setting up your simulations, um, you know, you know, you have to meet A, B, and C in order for this to be a good simulation and a good learning experience for the students. I think it also emphasizes a flexibility of, of your thinking though, too, Diane, kind of with that is that A, B, and C become less concrete. I think when you're, when you pursue this, this learning, when you pursue your certification, it gives you this understanding of, um, you know, I, I think about times that we we have had you know tech issues or whatever, um, and we've had to think to ourselves, okay, but what is the the core thing I need them to do, and can I? How can I still accomplish this? And so, um, no, it's not going to look the same as it usually does, um, but it just helps you like really think about. It's not about they always use this mannequin. It always does this. We always give it this way. It's about they are here to work as a team. They're here to experience the dying process. They're here to whatever. And, and can we still support that learning in a different way? Um, and, and still keep our, you know, and make, make good use of their time and, and their, their experience here. Right. Any, anything, you know, I shouldn't say any means to get the goals and objectives met, but <laughs> sometimes you have to think outside of the box and, and roll with it. But your main, your main goal is for the students, their goals and objectives to be met for that day, their learning goals and objectives. Right, right. So that reminds me of, I think I want to circle back to the idea that, you know, again, being proficient, at g- gaining experience in simulation can help you in multiple different teaching modalities outside of SIM. And as I think about, Diane and Takara's discussion of sort of being flexible and just keeping the end goal in mind and having that be a priority. Um, I'd like to share something that Takara had mentored me on when I first started my educator role. And I was struggling with trying to think about things to do in class and I didn't know, um, you know, what to do. And, And Takara reminded me of a priority, which is, you know, how can I support students learning there's any number of ways I can do it, but I want to be able to do it without me just talking the whole time um, at people. And, and so keeping my learning objectives in mind, but then recognizing that there's many, many different ways that I can, I can accomplish that and being flexible and adaptable and nimble um, in response to available technologies, in response to student feedback, in response to... Um, you know, and I think as I think about the pandemic, especially that's really made us have to be very nimble in, in the th- ways that we do things. And so, um, yeah, having having that 
end goal and that objective at the end of the day in mind is, I think, important. Um, I can say that, you know, I did my my CNE, my certified nurse educator um, certification first, and then I did my CHSE a couple years later. Um, and there is some overlap between those two, and and in especially in those types of domains where it's talking about um, how do you set a good objective, how do you measure that objective, um, how do you evaluate student learning, like those pieces. Um, and that's why I say, you know, good teaching is good teaching. Those pieces overlap between those two educator certifications. Um, and I think that was a great foundation for me as I went to pursue my CHSE. I think the CHSE just then took that for me, that that next step further um, to think beyond nursing, but also to think beyond um, like the immediate lesson. And so start thinking more, I guess, in a similar way to the, the CNE to think more about those systems and curriculums and processes and policies. Um, and, you know, I think some of that probably stands out to me more with my CHSE experience, because I also had more experience in maturity as an educator at that point as well, but just reinforcing how all the decisions we make, um, come back to supporting those learning objectives. Um, and so it's not, it's about having these, these systems in place that are always moving our students towards that um, development in, in the nursing profession. Great. So, so that brings us to then talking about, I guess, the benefits of certification. And I know that we've done quite a bit of that already um, in talking about why you got certified, but it's possible that, you know, maybe you had your um, reason for becoming certified initially. And if it's like a lot of things in life, you know, you do something for a reason, but then once you have it, you realize that you actually are reaping benefits um, or, or gaining things that you never even knew that you wanted. So I'd be curious to know if there's been any um, surprises or additional perks that you've encountered after getting certified that maybe you weren't anticipating or maybe someone wouldn't think about um, as they're considering whether or not to pursue certification. Can I add something up? I don't know if it's answering your question there, Patrick, but one thing I think for me with um, becoming certified is it gave me some tools to help me become better, I believe, especially with debriefing. And for debriefing, um, I find myself using those questioning techniques or trying to um, have students have have them come up with the answers or trying to understand why they did what they did, whether it was in clinical, where it was in theory. Um, It just sensitizes me to how I'm asking questions versus me being this person telling them, this is what you have to know, Um, especially if they've had um, some pre-brief or um, prep work, whether it's in class or whatever, it just, it gives a, a more rich uh, learning experience versus um, that, that I, thou, and being the, more the guide. Yeah. Thanks, Paula. I was actually just talking to Dakar about this the other week too. Uh, we have so many great conversations and I, I ask a lot of great questions really is what it is. And one of the things that um, a recent uh, grad student that we were working with, um, she had a, well, she had a very good question, actually, which was she was reflecting with me on the um, various debriefing models that she's seen utilized following simulation experiences. Mm -hmm. And so this grad student says to me, she goes, so what type of um, debriefing model do you use at clinical? And of course, I was really speechless because I said, well, I've never really thought about that, but I think we probably should have. And obviously, this was a really bright grad student, and I'm sure he's going to do some really amazing things. But it really got me thinking about, you know, we have all of these, all this literature and all of these discussions and best practices for simulation debriefing. Um, And even I learned about quite a bit of, even as a simpleton, I remember learning about that in my master's work, but yet I don't ever hear about that with regard to clinical. Mm -hmm. And if we're really talking about simulation and its capacity as an on-campus clinical, then it would stand to reason that we should have, um, 
maybe not identical, but similar ways that we go about debriefing those experiences. Because in my experience as an undergrad student, um, and even as a clinical instructor, a lot of times that debrief after the clinical day is, you know, this kind of generic, tell me about your day, tell me about your patient. And then I'm sitting here as sort of that sage on the stage of, well, let me tell you about all the stuff that, you know, you should have known about your patient. Um, and so how do we, how do we, um, I guess, choreograph, if you will, the clinical day debrief in a way that's similar and aligned to those best practices that we look at um, when we're conducting a simulation debrief. Mm -hmm. Just just to pop one more thing in here, and I don't know if it's really pertained to um, certification, but again, it's with the debriefing, as I was really surprised because the model we use talks about, you know, using feelings, you know, and, and having students come up with an adjective. And, and um, it's been interesting just this last spring with students, having them, um, they all go around, you know, give me a, a, a feeling that you had. And some of them, you know, really struggled, but they would do it. And at the very end of this last um, simulation that I did, I asked the question uh, for them to give me feedback on my simulation questioning styles. I mean, do you have anything that was really difficult for me to, for you to answer or questions that you wish I wouldn't ask? Asked? And I had two of them that said, you know, I, um, I really like the idea of you asking feeling questions because I want people to know how I felt. And then it frees me up to go on. And then I had two of them say, you know, I really don't like that question because I don't like having to expose myself like that. But then they continued talking and they said, but it was really helpful for me to hear that other people felt anxious, other people felt fearful. So I don't know, that's kind of probably aside from our certification here, but that was something that I thought was really interesting that keyed me into um, the importance of um, how you question people. I'm done. Thank well, and Paula, I think that's a good point of how you follow a debriefing model, right? So if, you know, the simulationist isn't following a debriefing model or not holding to those standards, you know, students probably pick up on that and really um, see the differences. So, I mean, it does show a really good point that the more people that are certified, you know, we're holding... They're, they're held to that higher standard and, that, you know, and our students are getting that better outcome. And that actually ties into what I had had wanted to speak to um, in terms of the benefits I've reaped, I guess, from certification, the unexpected ones, right? Because, you know, there are the ones that I, I, I expected to be a better educator. I expected to be um, better at my immediate job. But I think the one of the bigger benefits I've had um, from attaining certification is uh, I feel like I'm more capable of being um, like an advocate for change. And part of that, that, you know, all those great leadership pieces where you're, you're modeling the way and you're challenging the process and finding new, new avenues. Um, so I feel like I have a better grasp of the big picture processes, the why it's important that we follow a, um, debriefing model. Why is it important that we, um, you know, standardize these, you know, what things should be standardized to really support our, our best practices and, and understanding how that benefits, um, not just the, so we can all say we're, we're meeting it, but how it really benefits our students and how, you know, I, we've seen that here, certainly here at the Sioux Falls site, I know that our students have come to really um, expect the debriefing model. Um, to some point, some of our groups, um, they, they start to debrief themselves because they know the order that the questions go in. They know how we're going to do it. Um, we implemented the feelings wheel to help them identify their feeling words. And they came to expect that that would be there to support them. And so they, how these structures really support them and, and free them up to really um, learn and, and grow. And then that has helped me have that voice. I feel to um, speak, you know, in our committee meetings or with, um, other faculty or people from the public and really speak about the value of what we are doing um, and where we can grow and um, all these exciting developments that I don't know I would have, like, I mean, I think I would have been excited about them um, not being certified, but I think there's a, a different, I, I see a different value in them, um, understanding more about, about where it fits into that whole picture. Dan, do you have hidden benefits? 
you know, if you're going to say hidden benefits, um, the certification piece, I guess, I don't know. There were some parts in there in, in studying for the, the test that it was like, oh, yeah, there is this bigger picture to everything. I think you're right, Takara. You see more. You don't become so focused on just one thing. You have a, a more of a broad picture of how the whole system works um, and why the accreditation piece is important and the certification. And I think the more people we have certified, um, the more I think we'll all be on the same page. I think that's fair. That it really helps us develop as a team. It benefits the person, but then it benefits it. It, it benefits the team as a whole. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, everybody has just a little bit better idea of, you know, it's not just me here, but, you know, let's look at our entire program and, and where that's going, where that's headed. Right. That's fair. And it gives you that context too, of when, you know, when we update things or when we have to pivot in some way that we have a better context as to, yep, that does, that is sound practice. I do know that. Or I remember that from my, my preparatory work. And, you know, the other thing that I feel has been a, you know, not planned benefit and Dr. Carson, you probably have experienced this, you know, prior to me, but once I was certified, I felt like when I went to conferences and I fit in more, I wasn't as afraid to jump into, you know, different committees. Like right now I'm on the virtual simulation significant uh, or special interest group. Um, you know, and I, before I was certified, I was a little hesitant to jump in, you know, just kind of in that thought process of, you know, what if they don't think I really know simulation or maybe I'm, you know, not as elite as the others that are on this committee or, you know, just some of that. So it's kind of boost my confidence to get involved. Um, and then I actually ended up being the chair of the special interest group now. Um, so I'm serving as the chair, you know, to a national organization, special interest group, which kind of just, you know, keeps bringing me to that next level. So I think it just gives you that confidence to say yes you know, I've proven that I've understand simulation. I know the language and now I can start to build some relationships outside of, you know, our own institution. I agree with what you said. I think that um, before I was certified, simulation to me was a very closed box area. It took care of the scenario and um, with certification and going to conferences, um, meeting people who are publishing the standards and being able to ask them further questions about that. Um, it just broadened my view of what simulation is. It's, it's a culture, it's a world. Um, yeah, it's a bigger picture. Yeah, I would agree, Paula, that from a, from a um, simpleton standpoint, simulation is much more broad than my original understanding was. Um, because I think so much of that is informed by what our you know, experience is as a learner. Um, but to learn that simulation is so much more than just mannequin arms and, and um, you know, uh, talking heads. It's, it's much more than that, uh, which is why we have certifications, I suppose. So, so going along that vein, then, as we talk about the benefits of certification, of course, in order to reap those benefits, you had to do things in the way of preparing for your certification exams. And we talked a little bit about the requirements in terms of years of experience and such. But for those that are out there listening that may be entertaining the idea of pursuing certification, I'm hoping that our panel can talk a little bit about what you did to study for your certification exam um, what were there any obstacles that you had to overcome um, and, and what types of things that you need to do in terms of getting your ducks in order, so to speak, um, in order to become certified? Um, for me, when I first considered doing simulation and being certified within that, 
Uh, I attended a pre-con where they had uh, a review session for uh, uh, the, the CHSE exam. And I felt like I had done a little bit of reading, but not very much. And so that really opened my eyes that I need to do my homework more. And so I ended up, um, they have a uh, reading list and I read the articles. I read all the articles in that reading list. I did look at the book again a couple of times. Um, I talked to friends who um, were in other areas um, in the country who were considering it. So we had kind of a support group for that. And then I took the plunge and took the exam. That's great. Thanks, Paula. Um, anyone else have a different experience? Patrick, this is Alyssa. I actually did a lot of self-studying. Um, it's not that I didn't want to go to a review course. It, you know, I just didn't didn't have the time or the finances to go to a true review course. So, you know, on um, SSH's website, there's blueprints to the exam. There's recommended articles to to look at. So I actually made my own binder that, you know, I've been kind of sharing within our center of, you know, those printed. Um, I went through and highlighted and read the articles and focused on those for a while. And then I purchased a, you know, review book. There's a couple of them out there that you can purchase. And I really just took that along. Anytime I was, you know, had some downtime or on a road trip, I would read those and then just did a lot of the practice questions in the back. And then I sat for my, my exam when I went to um, the UNESCO conference. Um, so that way I, you know, I, I was kind of in the mindset, I feel like, you know, you go to a conference, you get energized, you get excited about a topic. And then that's where I sat for for the exam. Um, so I think there's just, you just got to personalize it. You know, some people study better alone. Some people study better in a, a review course. You kind of just have to do what works for your studying and personality to prepare. Yeah. So kind of going off of that, um, I, I had bought the review book long before I sat for the exam. I bought it uh, when I first started um, serving as a simulationist. So when I was teaching in my, in my first teaching job, um, and, um, I, when it was came time to sit for, or when I really, you know, sat down and, and said, yep, this is my goal. And I, and I will be sitting for the exam. Um, I obviously got the book out and went through that and used the review questions and all that. Um, I did attend a online review course, um, there was an opportunity um, through our, our um, simulation center at the time uh, to get reimbursed for that. So I, I took advantage of that. Um, it fell on my maternity leave. So um, I decided to spend my late nights up with my baby, um, listening to some um, simulation lectures and participating in discussion boards. Um, and then I did not spend as much time in the articles as um as my colleagues did. Um, I certainly had them, I got them all together and, and, and looked over them, but I, I think I spent more time in the book than I did the articles. Um, Cause when I was doing some of those practice questions, um, I kind of identified the areas that I needed the most um, growth in um, and, and really spent my time focusing on, on those pieces. So, you know, like I said before, I had had my um, certification in nursing education before. So when it came to those educational theories, um, you know, the theories of teaching and learning and writing good objectives and that sort of thing, I felt pretty confident in that. And I want to spend more of my time on um, some of those other elements of the role. And then I, I did want to add, um, you know, Alyssa mentioned um, taking her exam at the NAS NAXL conference, which is one of the main ways um, of sitting for the exam prior to the COVID pandemic. And I have to admit that part of my timeline or part of why I decided to do it when I did it is because with COVID, they um, allowed for remote proctoring. So previously you had to go to a conference or our closest two proctoring sites were, I think the Twin Cities and like Sturgis or something. Oh, Spearfish, it was Spearfish. 
Um, and so we didn't have one here in Sioux Falls and, um, that was a big barrier for me. So when they, um, provided that remote proctoring, um, I was a little bit worried it was going to go away. And so I was like, Oh, I better do it before, um, we have to return to, um, you know, in-person testing and I have to figure out how to, how to navigate that travel or whatever. Um, Diane, I think you were on a similar timeline to me with that. Yeah. So I did mine in April of 21 and over probably the year before that I took a review course. Um, and then, and I did buy, there is a book, the comprehensive healthcare simulation operations, technology and innovative practice book. Um, you know, I had that. And then when you look at, when you're on the SSIH website, um, they break down the test into the five domains and you have your percentage of what is on the test. Um, you know, what percentage of that domain covers the test. So I knew that, you know, healthcare was probably not going to be a problem for me. Um, but I knew IT was my weakness. Um, which cord is this? Which, how does this connect? Does this do digital? Um, is it video or audio? Those kind of things. So I knew I had to spend a lot more time there. Um, so I did take the review course. There's also Facebook pages out there with um, for simulation technicians. And, you know, there were study groups on there. Um, everybody was posting different resources. So I just reviewed all kinds of stuff. But I also wanted to do it while I knew I could take the test at home. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you for uh, sharing with us a little bit about how you were successful in pursuing and obtaining your certification. I am entirely confident that uh, your experience that you shared will be taken advantage of and very useful to those who are considering um, pursuing certification in the near future. So I think we want to do a little recap of, of all the important topics that we've covered in today's episode. Um, we talked about the difference between accreditation and certification um, by our uh, accrediting body, that is the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Um, we talked about uh, the two types of, of simulation certification, that was the CHSC and the CHSOS, and then the advanced versions of both of those and uh, talked about some benefits and, and um, success strategies in terms of pursuing certification. So, um, but I do want to thank you all for uh, participating in our important conversation on this episode. And for those of you listening, I want to um, let you know about our upcoming episode on which we'll be focusing in on one of the things we've talked about today, actually, which is interprofessional um, simulation. And, and we anticipate having uh, multiple different partners representing various interprofessional roles, which is gonna be, I think, a really nice follow-up from our discussion today in which we talked about um, interprofessional sim um, and actually being able to get uh, perspectives and insights into that process from people that don't have a nursing background. Um, I think that'll be really um, valuable. So, uh, and I, dare I say, it'll be a important episode, so you won't want to miss. And we will see you next time for the next installment of Important Conversations at SD State. Thank you.